flames reached heavenward as the cries of Michael Servetus decreased in volume. Eventually, his immolated body lay in the smoldering ashes of the books he had authored, burned alive, a martyr of the Protestant Reformation in Switzerland. Servetus' heresy was that he dared to disagree with one man's dogmatic view on the Trinity and infant baptism. Responsible for Servetus' horrible public death was none other than the often revered John Calvin. A few centuries before, a Polish monk named Nicholas Copernicus had observed the heavenly bodies and announced that the earth was not the center of the universe, that indeed the sun did not revolve around the earth. Copernicus did not publish this information widely, so the church allowed him to die in obscurity. Enter Johannes Kepler, who built on Copernicus' revelation. Kepler's mother was subsequently burned as a witch, though Kepler largely escaped the terrorism of the church. Then came Galileo, a well-known and connected scholar who published a paper proving that the sun could not revolve around the earth. He was tried for heresy. He was found guilty and ordered to be burned at the stake. At the last minute, a plea bargain was arranged. Galileo recanted the paper he had written and promised never to write such blasphemies again. He was spared and lived the remainder of his life under house arrest. It was not until 1991 that the Catholic Church announced Galileo was right. No apology was offered. We don't even need to go into detail about the horrors of the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the genocide of indigenous Americans, the Holocaust, suicide bombings, the horrors of slavery, or the more modern persecutions of teachers of the history of slavery or of evolution in this country. All of these and a million more atrocities were and continue to be committed by people on the grounds of fanatically held religious beliefs. Dogma has become the god of many members of most nations, most religions worldwide. The only response I can make to these horrors and more to come is expressed so eloquently in Amy G.S.A. Brooks' book, Another Scroll, Defiant Readings for Lectionary Year C. The reading for today is Dogma. You know me, you croon softly like a lover. And you imagine your voice peals out clear as a bell, drawing the faithful to worship. You know me, you cry, and it's the clamor of the klaxon that clears the factory floor at the end of the shift, releasing those who toil not out of love, but obligation. You whimper, you know me. As with a hollow clang, your last hope drops like a bell from a burning steeple. And I realize I do know you. I see you, no longer reflected dimly, but face to face. You name yourself dogma, but I name you false, a libelous pitiful, un-God, reflecting divinity only in the way that a mirror image is directly opposite of the true form. Released from your clinging hole, I rush to the embrace of mystery, to the wonder of uncertainty, to the great, eternal, holy beauty of the unknown. When I was a child, I knew with absolute certainty what was normal and right. Whatever happened in our home, our family, 
was normal and whatever my parents said was right. Guess what? As I grew, so did the questions. As I experienced little tastes of life outside my family circle, I began to have swirls of confusion. Fortunately, or so I thought at the time, I was brought up in a church whose dogmatic truth replaced my questions about what my parents taught. There was no ducking this. The Bible, the inerrant, eternal word of the unchanging God, meant exactly what it said. As I hit puberty and beyond, any questions that seemed to have varying answers in different passages of Scripture were simply beyond my understanding and had to be taken by faith. There was one major dilemma for me. When the church's dogma insisted that I was an abomination because of who I was and am as a person, there was no other authority to which I could turn with any kind of certainty. It was not until well past my fundamental and Pentecostal seminary training that I could glimpse, even glimpse, another way. Only in the past 20 years have I been able to look at absolute truths and see them as an adulterated falsehood. As I am becoming an adult, I'm shedding childish things. Things like certainty and unchangeableness. As we look at history and see the terrifying atrocities to which dogma has led, it's just a small step to realize that whatever the dogma that makes us the chosen, makes everyone who does not believe like us the other. If we are the right, everybody else is wrong. In our various tribal religions, we're not siloed from every other tribal religion. To me, the one escapable and frightening truth in dogmatic thinking is that there is no competing or opposing truths. Instead, everything other than my truth is considered to be fraudulent. Let's think about this for a minute, not too long. Are those of us who identify as liberal ever guilty of seeing our beliefs as the only truth? This is where religion, national exceptionalism, racial and cultural differences, and all the other isms show their true colors. Where do we turn when we recognize the failure of dogma? When our absolute truth disintegrates around us, do we just implode with it? Or do we rationalize and continue in a system that doesn't contain or comfort us any longer? Or do we just run? When I recognize within me or around me any set of beliefs that demand 100% of my allegiance, of my cooperation, or else, I've learned that I need to flee. I submit to you that when whoever or whatever grants us no liberty to expand our beliefs past their ancient foundations, we're better off running away, quickly. As Amy Brooks puts it, released dogma. From your clinging hold, I rush to the embrace of mystery, to the wonder of uncertainty, to the great, eternal, holy beauty of the unknown. 
A sage once said, if you can explain God, that's not God. With one breath, we speak of God's being beyond our understanding, God's ways past finding out. In the next, we neatly tuck God into a box. Omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, all good. Lover and friend on the one hand. Angry and vengeful on the other. God is mystery. And yet, God is clearly revealed. In the person of Jesus, we say. Now, I recognize this may not be the most welcome sermon in these years of obvious uncertainty. We long, as we really have from time immemorial, to know something, to be able to predict at least a pattern for coming years, for the coming year. One of the truths that I have come to amid this pandemic and this unsettling culture of toxic politics is that we can only plan for a variety of futures. We're back to that adage, the only thing that is certain, at least from a human viewpoint, is death. What we do with ourselves between the birth narrative and the closing paragraph of our lives is up for grabs and daily, perhaps hourly, revisions of our best laid plans. Oh, and nobody gets to write our own definitive epilogue. Is this comforting? <laughs> is this what religion is about? Uncertainty? Where are the answers we seek? Perhaps Jesus was talking of our multitude of questions, unanswerable questions, unknowable questions, when he said, the place of God is within you. As president of Chicago Theological Seminary, Susan Thistlewhite said of that esteemed UCC school, we are not here with the answers. Our job is to help students to formulate the questions. Austri Austrian poet Rainier Maria Rilke wrote in letters to a young poet, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart. And try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Do not now seek answers, which cannot be given you because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without even noticing it, live along some distant day into the answer. Perhaps these brilliant and insightful people can encourage all of us to be adventurers, to accept our understanding of the source of all, to be at best nebulous. May we see the one that we cannot imagine without metaphor and anthropomorphism. May we see that one as beyond any of our wildest understanding. And may we keep living the questions in the expectation that in the distant future, somewhere, whatever that holds, we may come to know that great love as we believe love knows us. May it be so. Amen.